So, so just one slight, slight correction, if I may. I'm actually from the engineering school. Um, and originally, thank you. And originally, the order was slightly, I wasn't expecting to follow such an amazing performance and talking about music. But I, I want to talk about something that I really care a lot about, which is uh, the, co the connections between mathematics and music. And to start this out, I'd like to uh, uh, say a quote uh, that I read about when I was actually in college. And uh, it kind of has stuck with me for a uh, number of years, which is that mathematics is music for the mind. Music is mathematics for the soul. Now, math and music, for anyone who studies music, it's, it's obvious that there's a connection between uh, math and music. We talk about quarter notes and eighth notes. We talk about uh, 32 uh, beats per, or bars per song. We talk about 90 beats per minute. Uh, what you may not be aware of is that, in fact, math mathematicians founded the language for music. So Pythagoras, who you may remember as the person about right triangles, the theorems that you learn about in high school, uh, actually was the one who was one day playing with a string, basically plucking a string and putting a finger down in the middle of that string. And he created two strings from that one. And he played each one. And he was getting interesting sounds. And so he said, well, what if I place my finger at different points? What kind of combinations can I create? And he was making chords. Uh, we don't need the slide quite yet. So. Uh, what he was able to do with that is he was able to divide that particular uh, 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 string into ratios, for example, 2 to 3 and 3 to 4. And he was able to come up with uh, intervals like this, as well as 1 to 2. And so he arranged all of those different ratios together, and he referenced it down to the lowest note that he could produce, and he came up with this. which of course is the Western musical scale. So for Western music, it's interesting that the Pythagoras, Pythagoras, the Pythagorean theorem founder, if you will, has developed the language for music that we of course listen to today. And now if you fast forward from 500 BC to today, we have mathematics being part of all music production from the standpoint of performance, a recording, even distribution. Um, and of course, sound is a wave, so it has to be produced in air as a disturbance. Uh, but we can use electronic devices and electronic components to produce that disturbance as well. And the process is a little bit different. For example, it yields things like this. This is an electronic saxophone. Uh, it actually does not make sound in and of itself. It's basically, think of it like a computer keyboard or a mouse. Uh, it senses information that you impart to it when you impart physical motion. And it has, if you will, a reed and, a, and has a mouthpiece. And you do impart air through it. But those are sensed by sensors inside of the device, sort of strain gauge and spinning wheel. And it allows numbers to be created that goes down the wire. It has keys that allow you to play and combine things. This actually has a saxophone fingering. Uh, but otherwise is uh, uh, like a saxophone, except it doesn't actually cover holes. It, again, creates signals that go down the wire. And these become performance information that then go to another device, which in this case is a synthesizer. And that particular device makes the waveform from the instructions. So if I put this on, I can go ahead and make some sound with it. OK, which is a trumpet sound. Now, you might say, OK, I've seen a keyboard. I've seen you, know, you can play sounds from a keyboard. What's different about this is this has a little more rich input, if you will, because of all the different devices that we're talking about. And it allows me to impart performance information and hear the resulting sound. So when I play these different sounds, for example, I can listen to it, adjust what I'm doing, and make musical expression. I can make familiar sounds. sound that most oftentimes gets young people excited.
right? So anything I want. And oh, excuse me. The, the cool thing about this is I can extend my musical knowledge from a saxophone to all these other different devices. How is it that I do that? Well, as an engineer, I like to think about things as block diagrams. So let's take a look at music from the standpoint of an engineer. You have a musician, OK, that's here over on the left. And, and that person has an idea as to what they want to do. They create instructions that go to an instrument. In this case, it is a transducer. That transducer creates sound. It imparts those instructions and produces a waveform that is what we hear. It then goes to two different people, if you will. It goes back to the musician who hears it at his or her ear. That's the sensor that then you use as an analysis procedure to adjust what you're doing. And this process is fast. It's on the order of milliseconds, on the order of how fast our brain works. Um, the listener also listens to the sound and decides, hey, I like this. I like to clap. I like to, to, to move along. Maybe there's an interaction which is financial in nature where I buy a song, download it, so on. Um, but if you will, there's that interaction as well. And the listener can be also the musician. What's interesting is that these digital devices work a million times faster than the human, you know, if you will, musical system. And as a result, they can be inserted right away, and they can be part of the performance experience. Now, I just showed you an example of synthesis, which is basically making sound from numbers. There's another type of, of manipulation that we do, which is uh, my field that I work in, which is signal processing. Signal processing is the manipulation of existing signals or sounds to useful ends. And to be able to show that, I'm going to do something a little bit different. Uh, amazing grace. Whoa, start again. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saves a poor wretch like me. was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. So, thank you. Thank you very much, and you notice it's still actually making a chord as I talk, okay? It's basically making that sound. What's going on here? Let's go. Put that down. Uh, let me show you. I can describe this using just pictures, uh, the process of making this type of sound. If I could have the view graph, please. Pitch correction is cut and paste. If you've ever used a computer, you know cut and paste. We have the original sound, which is my job. The original sound, which has timing and pitch errors. If you analyze the sound and you have a sound go into a microphone, it has a structure to it. It looks like it repeats over and over again. The portion that is the characteristic wiggle that you see is what basically you produce in a very short time frame from your vocal production system. And the repetition interval, that is the distance between these wiggles, corresponds to the pitch. Now, if you don't control that very well, it can actually vary the pitch, and you can have the pitch go from uh, and go actually up and down. Well, because these devices work so quickly, it's very straightforward to analyze that sound to find its characteristic signal, and then cut and paste. Put them back together, back, back to back, with appropriate intervals so that you have the right pitch. And this is done so fast that you can't tell that it's not there, OK? Now, how often is this technology in use? <laughs> Pretty often, OK? In fact, some people find it rather disconcerting, and I understand that. I can understand why someone would say, I'm not sure if I like this. Well, music is art. Uh, it is a medium which involves, if you will, a language or, or type of expression, and it involves choices. So you can have the choices involved or not. For a lots of popular music, it may be more appropriate. For more traditional music, perhaps not. But that's another tool. Think of it as another musical device to be, able to be able to be played, another musical instrument. And to that end, I'd like to talk about what the future holds 
Uh, when it comes to the future of music, it's quite clear it's in the palm of our hands. I'm holding an example of a musical device, which in this case is a tablet. But our cell phones, our tablet devices allow us to make very, very rich musical experiences. And they have everything you need. They have microphones. Uh, they have loudspeakers. If you don't like either of those, you can plug new ones in. Uh, they have memory. They have recording capabilities. They have distribution capabilities. They're communication devices, so we can email the songs when we're done. Uh, and it's everything. It's a recording studio, literally, that you carry with you. So with that, you can actually go. Oh, and there's one other thing. You have accelerometers and gyroscopes, things that allow you to control, as well as touch screens, very expressively the output of the sound that you're producing. So with that, let me go ahead and see if I can demonstrate this for you. idea. You can actually make sound with this. You can make sound with this and make very, very interesting music. And this represents tools for the future. So with that, I very much appreciate your time. Go out and make some music. Thank you.